Today we'll finish up the other risk, starting with disclosure risk, and then we'll see how far we can get into maybe the great thinkers in risk management. So we were talking about disclosure risk, and I mentioned this will probably be an issue for you sometime in your career, if not many times, because you have to get approval of the legal side, the accounting side, the regulatory side for your ideas. And there are times where great ideas will be dis destroyed by disclosure requirements. You just cannot do everything. Dodd-Frank, this is an old article, almost a decade old, but it just shows you that when this law first came out, what people had to do with it when they, they saw it. It's massive. Um, massive and complex regulation. Uh, the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 was 32 pages. The Banking Act, Glass-Steagall was 37 pages. Um, the law that set up the banking system in 1864 is 29 pages. This is what I was talking last class. Dodd-Frank, I think I said it was over a thousand pages long, but it's not quite, only 850 pages. But Dodd-Frank is not directed at people. It's, it's not even actually a law. It's directed at bureaucrats and instructs them, instructs them to create rules and regulations. There are 383 explicit questions for firms would have to answer if you break it down there's 1420 subsections it mandates 87 studies the problem is that all these reports and data is created no one's really scrutinizing them um, it's going to smother financial institutions in a bunch of red tape it's going to it's going to stifle innovation except for the one innovation it will not stifle is the innovation on how to get around bank regulations that's one thing the big money center banks are really good at is doing exactly what they want to do, but while while meeting the letter of the law. So it's just it's just over complex. Uh, a lady I worked with at USA, really smart lady, great, highly respected. Uh, she decided to go part time because um, she was really rising rising fast, but she decided to want to go part time. So I, when I saw her. Uh, a few years after this law was passed, I was like, well, wow, what are you work working on? It's kind of interesting and it's curious. He says, oh, yeah, my, my entire job is Dodd-Frank. And I thought, wow, I mean, it's great to have someone of her caliber working on it, but at the same time, what a waste to have someone of her caliber. All she's doing is not figuring out how to make the bank safer by complying with Dodd-Frank. It was how to get the bank to do exactly what it wants to do while apply complying with Dodd-Frank. Uh, so it encourages people to game the system because of its complexity. The complexity allows people to, to game the system. Its overall cost is just immeasurable. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. What does it actually do? And so, again, I recommend that one book I've mentioned a couple of times on regulating Wall Street. It goes through this law in quite a bit of detail. But it, it has risk-based capital, which means banks must hold enough net worth against their their risk it uh, has leverage limits it has short-term debt limits it has liquidity requirements we talked about how important liquidity has been to banks uh, it has resolution plans credit exposure requirements you know what what do you do when things go wrong concentration limits we talked about that under credit risk contingent capital if you're Lehman brothers and you need money and you can't get money from the capital markets what do you what are you gonna, where are you going to go? How do you get money? More disclosures, obviously, more and more disclosures. Some overall risk management requirements. Um, but does it do anything about the too big to fail? Government has this implied support. This is a big issue for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that people just assume if anything goes wrong, and we got Dodd Frank here, and Frank was one who, who essentially came out and said, yeah, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae they're they're safe. Nothing's going to happen to them. Right before they they almost went under. Um, so, you know, this implied government support, and that's part of the downside of the government stepping in to help, is that people assume that's what's going to happen, and so that that might actually encourage more risk taking. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about long term capital management. So, here we have this massive 848 page law 
that was written in response to 2008. So the obvious question is, if we had had Dodd-Frank in place in 2007, would it have done anything whatsoever to have prevented 2008? And I think most people think probably not. 2008 would have turned out just about the same. But that's, that's debatable. You can certainly read the book and read other sources. If you want to you know, uh, debate that with me, you can certainly talk about exactly what has changed. Now, definitely U.S. banks are far better capitalized today than probably than most of the other banks in the world. And they did a much better job in the U.S. of banks getting back to, uh, to safe levels of net worth. But I don't think that was because of Dodd-Frank. I think that's just banks really felt they needed to do that after, after such a crisis, just to build confidence back from the markets. All right, let's talk to the next risk. Um, I'm not a big fan of taxes. I do taxes for myself and for the charity, and I occasionally help with other people with taxes. I took a corporate tax class when my undergraduate as an accounting major. It's, it's quite complex, especially on some of these, these transactions I like to do it can get quite, quite uh, almost impossible to figure out how, how to work through the tax law. So what is tax risk? It's the treatment of an investment or some hedging idea looks great before tax, but completely falls apart after tax due to the timing the character or the source. By source, I mean, is it U.S., is it non-U.S.? The IRS, what they like to do is they like to move gains forward and they like to defer losses. That's the timing risk. I'll give you an example of that. If you hedge your gain, let's say you hedge and you hedge your stock portfolio. So your stock portfolio falls 20%. But your hedge is up 20%, so you're, you're good. Well, if the gain gets taxed today, while your loss won't get taxed for another 5, 10 years, you have a loss. You have to pay that tax. If you sell, now let's say the hedge, let's say your underlying portfolio did well, but your hedge lost money. So you say, well, we'll just sell the hedge, we'll get the loss, and we'll use that to offset the hedge's gain. Well, the IRS might consider that wash that, that loss to be what's called a wash sale, which means you're not, you're, not, you're not allowed to take it. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the, the IRS's wash sale rules can really destroy. And they're doing it because people have gained the system from a tax standpoint. And so what the IRS decided to do is, well, a few people are gaming the system, so we're going to destroy any hope for managing risk for everybody. We'll just make everybody worse off because there's a few people gaming the system, actually creating losses for the whole purpose of gaming the tax system versus the people that have losses and gains that really are hedged and they really do want to line up the tax with the hedge and IRS as well. Sorry, that's a legitimate reason, but we're not going to let you do that because people are going to game the system. So um, the character, it you know, this just changes over time how important this is, but is this normal income or is this a capital gain? Capital gain rates, capital gain tax rates have historically been much lower than, than ordinary income tax rates. But again, it changes over time. And then some items are taxed differently versus on whether they're U.S. or non-U.S. So sourcing is important because different countries have different tax rates. How do you measure this? Essentially, scenario analysis. And I'm going to talk, I'll give you a few couple examples. And, and an example I'll give you is exactly what I did, is you work with the tax department very early in the process, and you think in terms of scenarios. That's the best way for the tax, tax department to work. And most of these, it's not that hard to come up with, you know, five scenarios, like an average, a high, a low, an extreme high, extreme low, I like to do again the extreme scenarios. So look at the extremes on both sides, up and down. Uh, now you can actually go out and get an IRS ruling in advance if you're uncertain. The problem with that is you're now telling the IRS what you're doing. Um, so some people prefer to uh, ask for forgiveness instead of permission, but then you know you can go to jail for 
for tax avoidance. So you have to be careful. This this is a tricky area. So in my case, I was hedging. Just give you the example. I was hedging the stock portfolio with options. And so I thought, okay, this 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 is a great strategy. So uh, stock market crashes. I have losses on my stocks, but have big gains on my options. So that's great. The stock market's up. Got big gains on the stock market, and it cost me a little bit of money on the options. So the market crashes 20%. I'm hedged, so I only lose 5%. If the market's up 20%, I only make 16% because I use options to hedge. So that's kind of a scenario. So I went to my tax department and I said, okay, I'm hedging the, the stock portfolio with options. Let's work through some scenarios. And boy, we had a great tax department. I hope they still do. Have a good friend, still on Facebook, good friend. She was head of the tax department. In fact, I told her on Facebook not too long ago, I always bragged about knowing her because she was really good with taxes. And... I think what was even more impressive was how strong her department was. She built just a premier department. And I remember this one guy, I think his name was Kevin. Um, he he was the one assigned for my project and my word he did, the analysis he did, he gave me a 16 page report. And here's what we found out. So what, what could we have? We could have stocks up and losses on the options. That's one scenario. We could have stocks down and gains on the options. All right, if stocks are up, we have losses on the options. The IRS says cannot take tax write off on option losses until you take gains on the stocks. That's like, well, that's not good, but okay, we can live with that. Um, you know, we, we could sell the stocks so that we could we could move those losses up, but why would we do that? You know, so in this case, to say, like, okay, I can live with that. It just means we're, we'll have to delay those losses for a while. Here, the IRS says, must pay tax on the option gains, but no deduction on the stock losses. And so I said, we can sell the stocks and create the loss. IRS says that is fine as long as you do not buy the stocks back. So essentially they tell me, okay, you want to sell the stocks, that's fine. But you can't buy, the, I think it's for 90 days, but don't hold me for this. For at least 90 days. Well, that doesn't make sense. If, if we want to be in the stock market, we won't to own stocks. So I can't sell stocks and be out of the market for 90 days because I want to hold stocks. So I, I talked to the tax member, what if I sell the stocks but buy different stocks? What if I sell the stocks and then buy a portfolio of value stocks? So my core, this was like a core portfolio. So I have core, I have a portfolio of core stocks. So it's just S and P 500. And so I said, you know what, IRS, I'm not. This is up here with the IRS. This is what they refer to as the wash sale. I hate the wash sale rules. I'll tell you, I'm going through this project. So they said, hey, you can sell it, but hey. You cannot take the losses unless you if, you, if you buy it back, if you sell it and then buy it back in three or four days, that loss cannot be taken for taxes. So I thought, well, 
and this is what I'm talking about tax part. We're not, I wasn't trying to be, I wasn't trying to get around the tax code. I was just saying, you know, what if I sell the stocks and I buy a portfolio of value stocks and growth stocks? And that would be perfectly legitimate. I might say, you know, right now I think core is, is well valued. I don't think value or growth are particularly overvalued, undervalued. And so what if I sell this portfolio and then I split it between value and growth? But maybe I had, maybe I skew it more toward value or more toward growth, depending on what I think. And I say, well, the reason I sold the stocks was so that I could, I could set my up, myself up for a strategy of balance between value and growth. And the tax department said, not allowed. And my tax department even asks, what would you say under oath? In court and I would have to admit the my main reason for doing this was to somehow get around the wash sale so my question for the tax department which was one he was quite adamant about was does my does my reason for doing the trade have to be 100% to avoid the wash sale could it be 60% to avoid the wash sale, but I have a, I have a legitimate other 40% reason for why I'm doing the transaction? And he, he essentially had, um, convinced me that there was really not much I could do about this. So you have these gains on the options, because the stock market's down, so your options gain. You're, gonna, you're going to have to take, you have to pay tax on that. But you get no tax deduction for the stock losses. The only way you can get tax deduction for the tax stock losses is to sell your stock portfolio and not buy it back for 90 days. I couldn't even do this. What if I replicate it? There's ways to replicate owning stocks with derivatives. And he still said no. So anything where I sell the stocks and I end up with something similar, enough similar that it sure looks like taxes is the main reason I'm doing it. That's going to get me in trouble, and it's just not going to work. Um, so we finally, fi our final solution, and this is this is something just to realize with tax was, let's meet every November and assess. That's essentially what we came up with. Let's sit down in November, let's see what we have to work with, and see if, if there's anything we can do to try to minimize a horrible tax situation. Now, in 2008, you would have thought this would have been terrible because our, our, our stocks were down 30%, but we had huge gains. We actually, even though the stock market was down over 30%, our portfolio was actually up 1% because of these option trades. So we had huge several hundred million dollars of gains in the options. We had hundreds of millions of dollars of losses on the stocks, but we're going to have to pay tax on the options. You might say, wow, that, that's terrible. How did you get around that? Well, it, actually the way it worked out is that 2008 was such a horrible year. We had plenty of losses, legitimate losses in other places that our gains on our, our options were just not an issue. We, we more than offset them, so it, so it was just 2008 was such a horrible year. If all we had was the stocks, stocks down and options up, yeah, it would have been a disaster, but we had so many other losses all over the place, especially on the bond portfolios. It, it, just, it just didn't matter. We had plenty to offset. So that was our scenario. But you see how we went through scenarios. And the tax department was exceptional. They would not have been exceptional if I had come to them the day before I was trying to get this approved. So I gave him several weeks, and he did an exceptional job. He really researched it, um, and he understood it, too. He understood exactly what I meant by going through scenarios. And we went through several more scenarios than this um, just to understand, you know, what if it's a slight gain, slight loss, what if... We have a loss, then a gain, you know, all these kind of distant scenarios. So, so this is the way to handle, handle these type of problems. Get to the tax department early and think scenarios. Run through scenarios. All right, let's talk about operational risk. This is a huge one, and it's really beyond really the scope of what, what we, can, we can handle in this class. You could do 
several clients because operational risk is essentially everything else. So it's a risk that a procedure or a policy is not followed. Just something bad happens with the firm that's not, you know, interest rate risk, price risk, liquidity risk, credit risk. It's anything other than all the things we've already talked about. So it's everything else that can go wrong with the firm. It can, it can have to do with theft, internal controls, you got rogue traders, system failure. We may talk a few of these. Hiring policies, extremely important. I remember at USA just how strict they were. I, I like in interviews, I like to go, go really wild with interview questions. Uh, and I like to do it based on how the interview is going. So there's certain questions I really, really like to ask. And then there's some that I just think of and, oh, the hiring department didn't like that at all. They wanted me to ask every candidate the exact same questions. So that way, someone doesn't go, you know, two candidates start talking to each other, and that's, he's, they say, oh, you asked me this capital asset pricing model question. The other candidate says, well, you didn't ask me that question, and man, I'm an expert on that. That's no fair. Um, and just being real careful what you say. If a candidate comes in and starts talking about what they're doing over the weekend, if it has any religious connotation or political connotation, uh, boy, you just... You change the subject, you ignore it. There's so many, so many hurdles there and so many just high risk places there. Reputational risk, major headline risk. Um, there's just things you do not want on the front page about your company. Obviously lawsuits, getting sued for all kinds of things. I mean, there's just no limit. Operational disasters that weren't insured well enough. We'll talk about Br British Petroleum. So it's just everything else. How do you measure it? Extremely hard to measure. You could look at incidents reports. I think close calls are actually a good way. And there's several examples of where if someone had been more serious, closely looking at close, close calls. I remember one story of a, some military planes that had accidentally cut the lines of a gondola in, I think, in Italy. And people say, wow, what a freak accident that a plane would get that close. But there were actually incidents reports of people reporting that it there was close. It almost happened before. And if someone had taken, taken note of that, they could have said, hey, we, we're, we're taking too many chances. What are we doing here, uh, doing this for? What, you know, what's the benefit of, of taking such risk? And so you redesign policies and procedures to prevent those close calls becoming a huge, huge loss. Um, I remember working next to the risk management department when I was in one area. I actually was an employee in the risk management department for one week, and then my previous boss quit, and I took took his assignment, or he went back to his old job. So I was, you know, I got some exposure to these type of operational risk and how they're managed. Uh, and the lady, one of the ladies I worked with, people called her the corporate mom because she was just walking around looking for things people were doing. Um, one of the issues she discovered is uh, some people were using using needles because they had uh, diabetes and they were throwing their needles into the trash can in the bathrooms. And when the uh, facility workers came in, they didn't want to have to empty the trash because they didn't want to put the new trash bags in. It was much more efficient just to grab the paper out of the trash can and put it into, the, in, into their rolling bin. And these workers were getting stabbed by these needles. And in a time during with HIV and all other kinds of you know issues, hepatitis, those kind of things, it was really dangerous. And so she had to figure out a way to solve that. Uh, I remember once we were sitting, our, our offices overlooked the main entrance to USA. She was sitting at her desk and I heard some commotion and an elderly woman had gotten out of her car and had tripped on the walkway into USA. And my word, people were like, you know, I was going to say, oh, did you did you see that? And I couldn't tell her because she had, she had sprinted full speed and she was down there. I think she set a record for how fast she got from the the second floor down to the main entrance. Boy, it was just, she was just like, wow, she's already down there. And they actually redid that entire front entrance as a result because it was a very rocky, very dangerous entrance. Um, and just all those kind of stories of she she was the perfect risk manager. She always had her eyes out for any kind of kind of risk. I remember one story where she saw these two workers painting 
paying this uh, walkway across the road and they didn't have a ladder so one worker had the other worker by his ankles and was holding him out with no protection doing this painting and she just she just couldn't take it she told him to stop and wrote them up um, but essentially that's why I, that's why I say all employees of a company should be risk managers we should all be paying attention because a lot of these close calls we notice something and say wow that really could have been bad there's not a formal way to collect these so if you're not if, if you're not doing something as you notice something and saying hey we really need to adjust that um, then you're not doing your job as a risk manager or, you know that help protect your company you had one employee that boy I love working with this guy because you'd almost think he was a a major owner of the company but anytime he saw something that was dangerous he would come off it's wrong we got to change this we got to change this you can't believe what they're doing this is going to cause us risk that's the kind of employee you want to be that you're you're constantly looking out for your your firm how do you mitigate it well good procedures constantly monitored um, one thing I do, and so I'm going to give you my approach. You're going to think this is absolutely crazy, but I, I think this works. My approach was to take time in my job and figure out how I could single-handedly destroy my company. And the last few years of my career, I started doing these derivatives. I had a really great reputation at USAA. And so their, their approach was, oh, it's Ron nothing to worry about let them do whatever he wants to do and they gave me this incredible power to do these massive transactions that were quite dangerous they could have really wrecked havoc on the company quite extensively and there were no controls no one was watching me and so I went out I set up the procedures you know that's not the way it should be the person who's doing the transaction shouldn't set up the procedures but I set up the procedure so that if I did do a transaction that was dangerous, it would be discovered very quickly. Um, and then after I did that, I went to the CEO and I told him, you gave me this kind of power without any procedures. You don't need to be nervous because we now have procedures, but why did you do that? And the argument that it's wrong, you don't have to worry about it. You never know what an employee, you can have an employee that's been there for 20, 30 years, it's always been a great employee, but you don't know what's going through their mind. The guy uh, from um, Societal General that cost that company hundreds of millions of dollars, they don't even know why he did what he did. He had no personal benefit from it. It wasn't like he was, he was trying to cover up a mistake he'd made at work. He wasn't trying to make money. He just didn't like the company anymore, and he decided to cause them a huge loss. So you never know what people are going through uh, what kind of stress or any other kind of things. So, yeah, so none of us, not any one person, not even the CEO, J.P. Morgan, uh, should be able to make a phone call and destroy the entire company. So that's a good way to think about it. Maybe it's not, you know, early in my career I could not have destroyed the company, but I, I could have done some, some pretty good damage, uh, especially I was, as I was starting to do transactions. Um, so, you know, stop and think, does it make sense for me to be able to do what I do? What's the worst I could do and should someone stop me? I remember I did one derivatives transaction and the person who was supposed to do the procedures, he didn't, he didn't do his procedure. He didn't send out the email he was supposed to send out. He didn't double check my transaction. So I called him and said, hey, you didn't send out your email. And he said, well, I was just really busy today. And I said, no, you've, you've got to stop what you're doing. You, you are the front line to make sure uh, we don't, this company doesn't go under because of a bad transaction. So these are important things. So again, it gets back to what I was saying here. Everybody in the company needs to be thinking about what could go wrong and what procedures do you have, who's watching. Um, need to over-communicate everything, especially the extreme scenarios. So when we did our balance sheet immunization for the pension plan, I was careful to walk through, hey, this is what it's going to look like if interest rates do this. This is what it's going to look like if interest rates do this. I did it over and over again uh, just to make sure. Now, I realized that didn't really work because top management and the board, the auditors, you can repeat things 20 times, but they're so busy and they have so much hitting them, they're still going to forget it two or three months later. So you try your best to remind them, um, but make sure everybody's very, very well. We're going to see that in one of the case studies of how... Because 
management and the board were not communicated with. They made some really stupid decisions in reacting to a particular loss where if they just if they'd understand what was going on they they, they could have saved the company from going under um, so yeah this is this is the tough area it gets back to what you learn in your accounting audit class internal controls those are those activities those policies procedures that are you know part of the internal control system um, they can be preventative or detective, either one. Preventative strategies are those that are trying to reduce frequency, trying to keep something from happening. They can be detective, which is focused on severity. So they're detective, so something's happened, but you detect it early enough so that it doesn't cause a major, major, major loss. Typical internal controls authorization, making sure you have some reviewing. That was the big thing in my job as a portfolio manager was let's make Ron sign all the trade tickets so yeah I mean that's fine authorization is is good um, so who's who's uh, authorized to do the transaction who's recording the transaction that should be a separate person and then who's reconciling the transactions that should be another person you want to have separation of duties as well documentation obviously so every trade I did was filed somewhere I don't know if they made that electronic since then but documentation, so paper, electronics, something that shows every transaction that's happened in the company, some kind of financial record. Reconciliation, very, very important. Uh, I've dealt with some small entities that the reconciliation was performed by the person who was doing the transactions, which is never a good thing to do, but if you only have one person as a bookkeeper, you really have no choice but to do that. Um, but reconciliation, uh, trying to find discrepancies. So bank, bank reconciliations are extremely important. Security, just physical security, making sure assets are protected, locked up. Um, so that's just physical security, administrative security. Uh, make sure you're protecting you know, your online assets. I've been shocked at some of the things I've seen related to uh, Bitcoins and some other things. People are getting robbed uh, through some of the, just their how their cell phone is set up, set up or those kind of things. It's, um, it's amazing. Um, and then technical security, electronic records uh, from loss of theft. Obviously, you're worried about cyber security kind of things. And as I mentioned, separation of duties. So very standard stuff that you got in your auditing class. Um, you know, if you think about, we, ha we had this issue. So you've, you've heard of Madoff. He was the hedge fund manager, and he was essentially just stealing money from his customers. And so we were looking at Madoff. We were using a lot of hedge funds, so we asked about the Madoff situation. And we actually were talking to a firm that wasn't Madoff but had the similar issue. We were talking. I really liked them. It was an interesting firm. Uh, but they had a Madoff, and they actually hit the news. And the guy working for me, he said, wow, I can't believe we were talking to them. That, that could have been a disaster if we dealt with them. I, I was actually of the point of, I almost wish we'd gone forward because I think the procedures we had in place would have exposed them and we would have been fine. So what, what, how do you prevent a Madoff? And here, here are the keys that you need. I've had some students say, I want to start a hedge fund. If you're going to start a hedge fund, it's going to cost you a couple hundred thousand dollars, or at least a hundred thousand dollars to get it going because you need these three things. The first thing you need is the custodian custodial bank and it needs to be an independent custodial bank a bank that is not in some way affiliated with with uh, the portfolio manager they're, they're going to hold an account for the the assets the second thing you need is a record keeper they're going to calculate market values and returns so yeah good record keeper separate entity again it needs to be an independent record keeper third party someone that you can send the customer to and say okay here's a custodial bank they hold all the assets here's here's a statement from our custodial bank Here's the record keeper, 
and, and there's, they're telling you what the portfolio is doing, how, what its value is, what the gains and losses are, what its returns are. And the last thing you need is an independent auditor. And those are not inexpensive at all. And you want them to actually test the records for any any fraud or or you know issues. They can give a clean opinion. I think Madoff Madoff's off, uh, auditor. I think it was his brother-in-law. I'm not sure how did the custodial bank and record keeping. But I think even some of that he had control over. So he had control over everything. So all the numbers were coming from him or controlled by him. If you have three independent, and that's why on this firm we're looking at, uh, their issue was with the record keeper, I think we would have caught it. I don't think we would have done dealt with this entity. So I was kind of disappointed we didn't go forward. I mean, I'm glad we didn't because it would have looked really bad that we were, you know, we're starting to negotiate with a firm that was then uh, determined to be fraudulent. But I really think our process would have found it. We would have wanted all of these things. And plus... USA had their compliance people were exceptional. There's one lady, her name was Stephanie. I don't know if she's still there, but um, oh my word, she was so thorough. In fact, she was so good in compliance that when we did, did contracts with other entities, her and her team would go visit them to make sure every, all of this stuff was set up. And a lot of times she would point out things to them that would change their processes. She was so thorough. They said, you know what, we, I, I remember some of the portfolio managers we dealt with, they said, you know what, she was telling us stuff we'd never thought about before. So that's why I was kind of disappointed. We, we, I think we would have been okay. I think we would have said, you know what, in fact, if they dealt with us, we might have been, because of how strong Stephanie was, we might have been the firm that would have uncovered their fraud and would, would have been the ones that gotten them in trouble. So those are key. If you're going to start a hedge fund, then these are the expensive things you're going to have to have you have to cover in your hedge fund. Maybe you don't have to do it the entire time. Maybe the first three years you're only managing your own money and you can get away with not having an auditor. But at some point when you start taking other people's money, they're going to want all these kind of things there because of the risk. Glenn Holton's article, I don't want to need you to read the article. I'm just going to summarize it for you. But uh, if you have time, you might over the summer break, read it. It's Glenn Holton's article, Enterprise Risk Management. And what he says is uh, operational risk are becoming a much more significant issue today. And he wrote this quite a long time ago, back um, late 90s, early 2000s. It still applies today. So the world is about the same today as it was back then, but maybe even more concentrated. But he said things have gotten much, much more, more difficult for risk management. But he says, key to risk management, this is the reason I like his article, he says the three components are culture, procedures, and technology. And what's humorous about this article, or maybe not what is humorous, is the examples he give of how much bigger risk are today than they used to be. And he's writing this in the late 90s. So Orange County, one person causes Orange County, we're going to talk about Orange County in more detail later. Barings Bank, the oldest bank, the Queen's Bank in England. One person, Nick Leeson, in fact, there's a movie about him. He caused a $1.5 billion loss. Dalai Bank, a few bond traders, caused a massive loss. Sumitomo Bank, one copper trader, caused a huge loss. Now, these numbers look so small. I think Lehman Brothers lost this like in three minutes in September of 2008. So, these, so what he's saying is correct. It's just that with 2008... It just got more and more massive. And why, what's the change? Why is it we have these huge losses? And he's, he said what it is. And it gets back to what I said up here. My approach back up here is see how you can destroy the company. Because what has changed today is the transactions have gotten far more complicated. But they're being executed by one person, not by a team of people. So you have these incredible, in, in, in the, with Barings Bank with Nick Leeson. He was doing some pretty complicated trades, but he had complete control over everything. There was no one that had... It's not just that they didn't have people reviewing him. It's that they didn't have people smart enough to review him. They didn't know what he was doing. Um, and this one person can create massive losses because of leverage coming from derivatives. That's why when I was able to start doing swaps and 
options at USAA is like, well, you should not allow me to do this without new procedures because before I didn't, I, I couldn't do much damage to the company. But now if I can pick up the phone and execute $5 billion, $10 billion, notional amount and options, boy, I can do tremendous damage to this company now. Uh, so it's not that people are more unethical today. They may be. I don't know. I don't have any statistics on that. But it's that bad employees can do far more damage today than they could in the past. The losses can easily, could easily have been prevented with good oversight, but firms often don't go through them. Why? Because of the complexity. No one wants to admit they don't know what they're doing. So regulators, rating agencies are demanding best risk management, but they tend to be focused on the last thing that went wrong not on the next one and it's only in a crisis we talked about this really early in the semester when i showed you that um that that movie the duel that steven spielberg movie when it gets to a crisis you start focusing on survival that's you don't want to get in that position you want to say you know like bearings bank now we're just worried if we're going to survive you've, you've got to act before that and get procedures in, in place um because boy, with the nick leeson one at bearings bank the story in that book, I love that book because, boy, especially you should buy that book for audit, your auditing friends. It's called Rogue, Rogue, R-O-G-U-E, Rogue Trader. But he had an auditor show up to his desk, and he knew it was done for. This auditor was really good, and he said, I, I'll just have to confess. And right when she's about to sit down and start her audit, she gets a phone call, and they say, we need you back in London. So she goes back to London and her understudy, he takes over the audit. And this guy is like, wow, Nick Leeson, you're so cool. You're so smart. Wow, it's such an honor to be working with you. And he missed, I mean, he missed things like Nick Leeson said he had a $300 million account with Citibank. You know, someone tells you they have $300 million sitting at a bank. You're going to confirm that. You're going to call a bank and say, is there actually $300 million there? But he never did that. And just how clueless management was, Nick Leeson was reporting big gains when he was actually getting large losses. And they, they were so enamored with how great he was doing, they invited him to a conference in New York City. And he thought, well, I can't go to New York City because if I go to New York City, all of this, all of this uh, hiding that I'm doing, all of these bad, f f fictitious transactions... I'm going to be exposed. So he told management, I can't do that because I need to stay at my desk and trade. He said, you know, I'm making you all this money and you can't have me go to New York because I'm trading. And so what they did is say, come to New York, we'll set up a Bloomberg terminal in your hotel and you can keep trading. If they had stopped him then, they could have saved themselves hundreds of millions of dollars. But instead, they brought him to New York and let him keep losing money. Um, just amazing how clueless they were about this so um, yeah the, you know and that's one reason why banks require their employees to take vacation it's kind of a nice thing it's like you have to take a two, two week vacation uh, some of the financial officers at USA they had to take two week vacations uh, they never did that with me it's kind of interesting In my job it probably would have been a good idea to have me take a two week vacation given the trades I was doing but it wasn't required at that time but I do know many of our UTSA alums they were in jobs where they're required to be away from their office with no contact whatsoever just in case it's not because they want them to have good work-life balance but it's because they want to make sure if they're doing something fraudulent it's probably going to be exposed during that vacation so management is bad at it because they don't want to admit that they're stupid at usa it was great that we had the ceo that he was so confident he didn't worry about looking ignorant he, just, he was confident of his intelligence that if he didn't understand something, he kept asking. A lot of management's not like that. They don't understand something, they'll pretend like they do just because they don't want to look stupid in front of their peers. So, just some quotes in here. You can somewhat read this on your own, but just real quickly, culture. You need a, a company that risk is centered. That's why I asked on your paper one, look and see if there's something about culture in their annual report or philosophy What's the mission statement of the business? Most of these big money center banks, risk should be part of their main mission statement. Is that part of their culture? Um, 
you need behavior that reduces risk to not become personal risk. That if you do something to reduce the risk of your company, you should not be exposed to be losing your job, being fired. Um, risk management, you should be able to rock the boat, ask questions, challenge the establishment. Now, at the end of my career, I was, I was ready to retire, so I didn't have to worry so much about losing my job. And so I was pretty vocal, and I had, I had people who asked, you know, I actually have other officers call me and ask, why haven't you been fired yet? Because they'd see how vocal I was, and it looked like the CEO was attacking me because I was pointing out something that was going wrong. And what I discovered was he wasn't mad at me. He was mad because there was a risk that wasn't being addressed. He actually appreciated that I was bringing it up. He just didn't have a good way of showing it. He would just lay into me. Um, and I finally discovered, you know, if you were honest with him and told him everything, he would scream at you, but he wasn't going to fire you because that's what he wanted. The people he was firing were those who knew something bad and weren't telling him. So he was all about, yeah, tell me, I want you to rock the boat, ask questions, challenge everything. It was his reaction to that that wasn't too helpful because he was really beating people up for doing exactly what he wanted them to do. So it, it, was, it was a strange culture. I think the fact that I was single, had plenty of money saved up, kind of gave me this freedom that I was like, yeah, fire me. You have to give me severance, and boy, I'd be even better off. Not that I was trying to get fired, but you know, I wasn't really that worried about it. Uh, culture defines what behavior, behavior is condoned and what's shunned, and that's really important. What personal risks do you have to take? People are not going to take huge personal risks to save the company. Um, so you need individuals making decisions, not committees. A lot of questioning, and then you want to see people admitting ignorance. Uh, the, you know, people that are willing to say, you know, I just don't know. Then procedures are important. What procedures do is they help protect you from this personal risk taking. If you have procedures, that empowers you. It's much easier to say you're violating this procedure than it is to say, well, I think what you're doing is too risky. You should stop doing it. If you have a procedure, yeah, you can usually shut people down. Lack of procedures increases that personal risk. Um, procedures procedures re reduce the risk, promote action. But those procedures need to be continually monitored and changing. Uh, a lot of organizations start with procedures. And they start with procedures that come from the regulatory side and the radiancy side. They don't start with what culture do we have, what do we think about risk. They said, hey, we need procedures. What do regulators require? What do radiancies require? That's not the way to start because regulators and radiancies, they're about risk minimization. But your goal is risk optimization. You want to do optimal decisions, not just minimizing. It's easy to minimize risk. You just stop doing stuff. But you want to take risk. You just want to make sure you do it in a way that is controlled. Now, my last job when I was a portfolio manager, I had procedures, and I could not carry my procedures. If, I, if, they, if, if they handed me all the books of all my procedures, I could not have carried them. And my first few weeks in that job, they were having me sign stuff left and right. And I wouldn't sign it unless I understood it. And I remember this one thing. They said, you need to sign this. And I looked at it. I said, what in the world is this? And the people asking me to sign it didn't know what it was. So I, I went through it. And it was several different things I discovered. It, wasn't, it was one document, but it was actually several different things. I had to go through each one of those. And I discovered... But some of the things they're having me sign were things I had absolutely no knowledge of or any control over. It was transactions people outside of the company were doing that they didn't share those with me. So I had no idea. So I finally started signing it, but I would sign it saying, I'm signing this only for pages 3 and 10. And I made it real clear when I signed it. Now, the compliance people took that. I don't know why they took that, but I, I made it really clear. I was only signing acknowledging page 3 and 10 were correct. The other pages, I had no idea. Uh, so you have to be careful that procedures don't become just check the box, that there's actually something there. And technology is extremely important for risk management, but you don't want technology to be the most important thing. Risk should be the focus. Actuaries, you actuary science majors, this is a his, his issue for actuary majors. 
Um, sometimes the actual profession so loves modeling that they just want to do modeling and they forget that they're doing modeling for a pur purpose. Um, so, you know, don't, don't say, hey, give me a hundred million dollars and I'll go find you a, a risk technology system. You need to think about, hey, what technology do we need? What are we trying to accomplish? Let's go find the one that fix, fits there. Um, and one of the hardest things is, is consistency of data. You're trying to manage risk from a diverse organization. Everybody has their data in different ways. So the technology might just be making sure you can collect the data. I had to do a lot of really manual things in my career simply because we, we didn't have an automated way of doing it. Hopefully that's been fixed now as, as technology has gotten better. Your measurement risk needs to be perspectives. You can't just constantly be looking in the rearview mirror. Um, and again, remember the gospel in, garbage in, gospel out. Um, here's the British Petroleum. 2000, April 2010, they had a major oil spill. I found this article about British Petroleum in my, uh, my file cabinet. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I started reading it. And they said, we learned, we learned our, our, our lesson on risk management. So they said it was a perfect storm of aging infrastructure. They said they were being overzealous with cost cutting. It was risk blindness. You know, they weren't focused on risk, concentrated on the form and not the substance of regulation. They were just going through the motions, ignoring warning signs. We talked about that, you know, close calls, put profits first. They didn't think there was even any overarching risk management issue. It was just these kind of things. Just perfect storm. They just all kind of lined up. So they said, now we're much better at risk management. Well, I kind of lied to you. This was an article I found in my file cabinet, but it wasn't after April 2010. It was actually written in November 2006, four years before their massive oil spill. Um, so maybe they didn't learn their lesson <laughs> uh, at all. So, you know, it's 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 possible they did and they're doing really well but there's just other things that come up so I say the spill was but these are actually quotes from an article about other things so what about September 2008 who said this and I, I give you the answer down here but in September 2008 this guy Joseph Cassano said it is hard for us without being flippant to even see a scenario with any kind of realm of reason that would see us losing one dollar in any of those transactions. We're sitting on the, on a great balance sheet, a strong investment portfolio, and a global trading platform where we can take advantage of the market in a variety of places. He said that in September 2008, just a few weeks before AIG went under. Now, was he lying, hoping they made it, or was he that? that ignorant of what was going on in his firm. Now, I've, I've worked with the guy that came from AIG after all of this, and, and I, I, I somewhat believed what he said, that part of AIG's problem was, was Greenberg retiring, and Greenberg was a micromanager who just looked at every transaction. And after he left, they had all these wonderful procedures, but they didn't have the management culture anymore that they lost with Greenberg. So he, th he thinks Greenberg leaving is one of the reasons these transactions got approved and brought the company down. Um, so, you know, it's possible. That's the kind of the CEO I had, very micromanaging, but always thinking about risk. It can be really irritating at times, but other times you think, wow, this, this really does give us a safer company. Um, so, you know, how do you handle this? So a big component of this is planning. It's thinking about the future. And we're terrible at thinking about the future. And I have this article here. Uh, I I don't know if I want to go through this article uh, in detail. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. I might show it to you really quickly, but I do recommend it. I'll put it out there on Blackboard so you can read it. It's a, it's a couple of articles. It's one by this guy, Paul Sappho. It's another one by, by da Daniel Kahneman and a few other people. Two really great articles. Um, I have it. I have it out on a blackboard, and I have it highlighted. I'm, I'm going to hit a couple places with it here, just real, real, real quickly. Um, but it's this 
issue that we use planning, we use looking into the future, forecasting, modeling, we use that to make decisions. And yet the data shows we're really, really bad at this. I'm going to talk a little bit more when we talk about Doug Hubbard and Annie Duke and, and uh, Taylor and Kahneman and some others. We'll, we'll, we'll talk in more, more detail with their ideas of why we're so bad at this and, what, and even more important, what can we do to fix it. But I want to just real quickly run through what these two authors have to say. We may not finish it today, but today and then the beginning of the next lecture. So this first article, The Six Rules of Effective Forecasting, this has to do with this operational side because we're forecasting the future to try to manage the risk of the future. And he starts off saying there's a lot of people who believe that forecasters are making predictions. And that's not true, but firms that believe that, that the purpose of a forecast is to predict the future, get themselves in all kinds of trouble. First of all, we, we don't know the future. The future is far too complicated. There's far too many things that can happen. A lot of people, their forecast is a one-point forecast. We used to do those where I worked, and it's like I've, I've become convinced that these one-point one forecasts, you know, one-scenario forecasts are a complete waste of time. Some people say we do forecasting to help make decisions, but forecasts that have are trying to predict one future, the exact future with no scenarios, I've never seen those type of forecasts be used to make a decision. What I've seen is decisions made, and then people tried to somehow put that into a forecast, not to see if the decision was good, but just because for some people, for some reason, people think we need forecasts of the future, even though we know they're blatantly erroneous, so far off, but most people don't go back and actually look and see how bad their forecasts were. So he says the primary, and I absolutely believe this, the primary purpose of forecasting is not to predict the future, but to predict the distribution of the future. Another way of saying this, the primary goal of forecasting is risk management. And we'll talk about this more, especially with Doug Hubbard. The real key is brutal, brutal honesty about how ignorant we are. Above all, the forecaster's task is to map uncertainty. A forecast must have logic to it. The wise consumer of forecast is not a trusting bystander, but a, as a critic. Um, so what is a good, what is a bad forecast? So here's what he's going to do. He's going to say, number one, define that cone of uncertainty. What is that distribution? So you want a forecast that somewhat tells you what's going on. So when we did some of these type of forecasts, I was trying to understand, okay, I've got this pension plan that really messes up interest rates fall. I have this bank that does well if interest rates are high and the yield curve is steep. Have this life insurance company does well as long as interest rates don't move much and they don't get too low. Um, how can I run so many scenarios to see what's going on here? And what I was discovering is, well, these entities, when I run a many scenarios, they somewhat offset each other. There are some advantages of having these three entities. So my so my my forecasting the distributions built my intuition that I don't need to 100% hedge these three entities. I, I can let them somewhat hedge each other and let them play off a little bit. If I over hedge one of the entities, I may be making us risky because that entity may be hedging another one. So it's revealing those overlooked possibilities. It narrows the decision space. That can help you. I visualize this process as map mapping the cone of uncertainty. What are those possibilities? The forecaster's job is to find that. Most important is defining its breadth how uncertain you are. So most people are honest, honest enough on this because we're overly optimistic. So drawing the cone, of, the cone too narrowly is worse than drawing it more broadly. And that's where I got from Doug Hubbard is when we say this is my 90% scenario, it's really more like our 40%. And you'll see that when you watch the Doug Hubbard. The cone can be narrowed as you get more information. And that's one reason you pay for more information. It most commonly considered... The most, uh, the most commonly considered outliers are wild cards. They, they tend, they are trends or events that have low probabilities, but there are probabilities you simply 
can't cannot quantify, but that if the events occur, they give a large impact. We'll talk about that when we talk about Caleb Neeson and the whole Neeson and the whole idea of black swans. The tricky part about wild cards is that it's difficult to acknowledge sufficiently outlandish possibilities without people just saying, "What are you talking about?" Now we did do this for our work. We talked about, "Wow, what if?" A hurricane did this, what the earthquake did this, what if we had a hurricane and earthquake in the same year? So we, we did talk through them to see how, how could we survive that. The essence of what makes forecasts hard is that human nature is hardwired to abhor uncertainty. Just look at the forecasts economists give. You know, think about all those forecasts that were done in December of 2019. Was anybody anywhere in the ballpark in predicting 2020? We were talking about pandemics before 2020. We were talking even about COVID-19 before 2020. That's why it's called COVID-19. And yet, you look at economic forecasts, even economic forecasts look real similar to what has happened the previous three quarters. Uh, we, we don't, you know, no one wants to predict, you know, if anyone had predicted a negative 30% GDP second quarter of 2020, they would have been laughed out of the room. The result of Y2K, non-event, was um, people said, well, people are crying, crying wolf. Well, maybe, or maybe all the work they did prevented it from happening. 9-11, um, uh, should we be able to see that, given that there is an attack on the World Trade Center just a short time, a few years before that? He asked hard questions about whether a seeming wild card is in, in fact deserves to be moved closer to the center. Right, so that cone of uncertainty is really important. I, I want to finish this article up next next video. So I'm going to stop here, and we'll we'll finish it up. He has some important things to say that I think, if you can let it sink in and think about it, not only will you make you sound really smart in interviews because this is the kind of stuff they want you bringing up in interviews, but I think it can really help set your career off so that you don't make the huge mistakes most finance majors and actual science majors majors make early in their career. Um, so anyway, we'll start. We'll start here next class.